Welcome to Gracefully Green. I'm your host, Attorney Henry Gornbein. Please go to our Gracefully Green website as well as our YouTube channel and watch our show with my guest, who is the managing partner of Lipson Nielsen, Jeff Nielsen, as we discuss the issue of the gray divorce, which is different from a typical divorce. Jeff, welcome to Gracefully Green. Thank you very much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about who you are and the firm Lipson Nielsen, which you are the managing partner of. Well, I've been practicing far too long, uh, 40 years. I'm, as you said, the managing partner. Uh, my background includes a, a wide area of legal practices. I have a master's of law in taxation, which comes in handy in uh, quite a few areas of law. And I've been a practitioner in litigation involving probate litigation, so I'm well equipped about the uh, dynamics that often arise uh, incident to the passing of a, of a married couple, uh, as well as practicing in family law. Our law firm is pretty much all purpose. Uh, there's only a few areas we don't specialize in, uh, but generally for typical clients' uh, legal needs, we have people that uh, can take care of it in a very uh, effective and uh, cost-effective fashion. Jeff, why is a great divorce different from other divorces from your perspective? Okay. Well, fundamentally, divorces usually involve three main subjects, a typical divorce. One is issues of division of marital property and allocation of debts. Uh, issues of uh, spousal support are always present and have to be addressed. And finally, issues involving child custody, parenting time, and child support. The gray divorce differs markedly because typically there are not issues involving children. And the primary focus is looking at the assets for an equitable division of those at marital assets and liabilities and with regard to potential support. But, but fundamentally, the big difference is that in divorces where they occur relatively younger in age, one or both of the parties is calling it quits and they're looking to, in some fashion, start over. The great divorce, you have individuals where, because they're older in life, they're looking to finish well. And it's a whole different perspective as to how the attorneys and the parties can hopefully collaboratively work together to make it a win-win situation over the big picture, even when it's occurring in a sad event such as the dissolution of a marriage. Let's talk about a long-term marriage with people in their 50s and 60s, and you're talking about often, you know, 25 to my record is a 50-year marriage, so, but these are long-term marriages. Well, the context there is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the younger marriage because of where people are going to advance in their careers. Oftentimes in a younger marriage, one spouse may not be employed outside the home. In an older marriage, hopefully there's been an accumulation of assets. There's typically, if one or both parties have worked, there's an accumulation of retirement benefits or retirement savings. And the impact really comes into play in terms of how these parties are going to land is the ability, if the parties are still working or if one of them's working, does the one party who has not been regularly employed through most of the marriage have an opportunity to re-engage the workforce to start providing income for his or her own benefit? And that is usually a real significant issue because it directly impacts uh, the issue of whether or not spousal support is going to factor into a resolution of the marriage. Now, Jeff, often we have something called an empty nest syndrome where children grow up, they leave, hopefully they leave for good, often more and more they don't. And you're staring at each other and saying, is this all there is, or what do we do for the next 20, 30, or whatever more years we have out of your life? What about the empty nest syndrome, so to speak? Well, I've often heard the expression like, uh, why is it, you know, from a client, like, well, why are you getting divorced? And it, regardless of age, right. and you often hear the term, well, we, we've kind of grown apart. And it really comes down to it that, that while there was a focus during the early years of the marriage, typically perhaps, as you say, emptiness involving children, a lot of the focus was on raising these children and not shall we say, working on their relationship. There might have been a division of responsibilities or a division of focus, but the bottom line is 
all of a sudden the kids are off to college and they suddenly find like, well, I don't like the same movies you like, or I don't like the same restaurants you like, or I don't like you the sports you like. They find that they have very little in common. And typically that loss of intimacy then naturally transcends into uh, other aspects of the relationship. And they basically find that they have a marriage that was built on sand and, and not on firm ground. And that's it. Sad but true. Now, we have financial issues, and it's like if you're in your 40s, early 50s, perhaps, you can recover more easily. But as you get into your late 50s, 60s, and even 70s and get a divorce, you can't really recoup and recover. Tell us about that issue. Well, this dramatically hits the point where you have a marriage where there's effectively uh, a primary breadwinner. And in that case, the primary uh, earner in the, the household, while the divorce proceedings can be a significant disruption, at some point when they resolve, there's a continuation of whatever his job was or her job was before the uh, divorce proceeding occurred. So for that spouse, it can any kind of financial hit that the divorce may occasion can provide a fairly recovery within a relatively short period of time. And they're not reentering the workforce with a spouse who may actually be working, but there may be a significant income disparity. But with that income disparity, there's no upward ability to really uh, enhance the amount of uh, income uh, that makes up for what the loss of the income from the other spouse since the marriage is ending. If the one spouse isn't e even working, that's a real problem. Oftentimes in a younger marriage where you may have that situation, there's the notion of uh, rehabilitative alimony. It's like, okay, I understand that you're not in the workforce now, and so I'm going to provide her some support for that that one spouse for a certain period of time to kind of allow them to maybe get some additional uh, uh, training or abilities to enhance their uh, attractiveness for a future employer. When a person gets older in age, that opportunity really falls by the wayside. Let's cover another issue, and that is often one spouse is a main breadwinner or uh, both spouses, perhaps they're fully employed or not fully employed. And then someone who has been out of the job market, uh, they have to return. And when you're in your 50s, 60s, there aren't the opportunities and you're left behind. So how do you deal with that issue? Well, frankly, within the divorce context, that's what spousal support's all about. In the younger case, there may be some aspect of a significant disparity um, that, you know, there's rehabilitative alimony. But when you get to a longer term marriage uh, with someone where there's a significant income disparity, that's where spousal support comes in. And candidly, and I know you, there may be issues of whether it's a second or third marriage, but in a sole marriage, long term marriage of 25, 30 years, and you can see permanent alimony being awarded because, and this is one point I want to emphasize. People always have a right to go to a trial, and a court will do its best to equitably divide marital assets, and the court will, you know, do its best to assess the needs for spousal support. But the court is limited in the kinds of remedies and ideas they can come up with, and that's why I think it's incredibly important that to the extent that a, the parties to a marriage can work collaboratively with a, a financial planner and other experts to craft the result, they have a far greater ability to undertake creative ideas that, that meet the objectives of what both parties want to attain. And that's why, uh, you know, through, whether it's through mediation or through a collaborative uh, attorney representation, the parties are in the best position to know their needs and hopefully work in a fashion to come up with something creative. And this can certainly involve things like pension plans or retirement savings as to how to provide in a very efficient fashion for both spouses. Jeff, you're raising really an important issue. I mean, judges often will tell anyone that the best decisions are those that are carefully crafted, that are worked out uh, with uh, competent attorneys, financial planners, uh, pension experts, to tailor make something that fits the needs of an individual couple and in an individual marital state. And 
judges don't know you, and they'll say, once you're in trial, you lose control, and your options become much more limited. So you're raising a very valuable point. And that point, too, is, and I do mediation work as well, when the parties can agree and come to an agreement, they have ownership in that agreement. And having that ownership gives them a better feeling about it. You go to trial and get a result from a judge, more often than not, both parties are going to walk away unhappy. Sure. But, I, but I can give you an example of why the creativity that parties can work out. For example, if you have a situation where one party is going to receive spousal support, okay, under tax reform uh, a few years ago, it used to be that spousal support was deductible to the payor and income to the payee. That's gone in terms of new arrangements. Uh, existing arrangements were grandfathered. Let's say you have an example where you have a, uh, a situation where the party that's going to be paying spousal support has accumulated a significant 401k account, where the other spouse who's going to be receiving the spousal support has not. Well, a court may simply say, well, I'll tell you what, that's what we're going to do. With the 401k, we're going to divide it 50-50, and there you are. Right. From a planning point of view, because the distributions that ultimately come from the 401k are going to be taxable income, one creative plan would say is, okay, I know I have to provide you a certain amount of spousal support, but here's what I'm going to do. Instead of it being a 50-50, division of that 401k, I'm going to have 75% of that 401k go to the spouse that needs the spousal support. So you're creating the fund to provide that spousal support, and you're also doing it in a very tax advantageous fashion because the spouse who's now going to take distributions from the 401k is going to pay tax on it at their lower income tax rate as opposed to the other party who would have, if they'd taken that money out, may have had to pay a higher tax rate. But this is just, you know, uh, uh, one aspect of the creativity that one can employ to basically, in so many words, get Uncle Sam to help pay for part of the spousal support. Well, it's so important. And this is, again, why creativity is important, why you can create a winning situation where it's going to trial so often as a lose-lose. And the other point that you raised that I want to uh, hone in on is the fact that through mediation or negotiations, parties own and have a lot of control over the result that comes to pass in a divorce. But if you go to trial, you don't have control, you don't have ownership, and that's where so many people are angry and bitter, and that's where the litigation comes with more and more appeals. So you're raising some very important points. Again, assets and debts any different in a long-term marriage, and you're kind of touching on it now with regard to spousal support, but should there be a disproportionate distribution, especially in perhaps a 40 or 50 year marriage where one person is still employed and the other one can never work or probably never will? Well, in terms of a property settlement, the, the law is fairly uh, straightforward in terms of that the court can't really deviate much from a 50-50 uh, splitting of marital assets. But the one potential exception to that, and it would also apply where a prenup's involved, where one party might be a second marriage, where there's a prenuptial agreement that says that there's certain identified separate property that would not be subject to division. And a lot of people th figure, well, I've got this prenup and I've got this separate property, so I'm good in terms of having that protected. Well, the law is very clear that when it comes to spousal support, the courts can invade that separate property if it's necessary to provide and fulfill and meet and satisfy that spousal support obligation. Clearly, in a long-term marriage, spousal support is probably the most uh, tricky issue. And it is often complicated in the gray divorce where one of the parties has medical issues. I mean, the old notion that the marital vow in sickness or in health, you don't get to walk away from that. In the situation of a gray divorce, if one party has considerable um, uh, medical or other needs, you know, you know, Alzheimer's is an issue. And the the question is, is that the provision of additional insur medical insurance coverage is an important consideration. And they all affect spousal support. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's like you're dealing with a lot of moving parts and they all have to be coordinated in some fashion, especially if you're trying to be creative and do what's best for each party. Social Security, uh, it can become an issue. And the law is that automatically, if you've been married at least 10 years, the spouse is entitled to Social Security based upon employment records, uh, being married or a remarriage. But again, that's an issue because you can't touch Social Security. Yeah, the law is the law. But again, from the standpoint of planning, it's a stream of income. And uh, it just has to be taken into consideration with the other resources that are available to the uh, uh, parties to try to resolve it equitably. Jeff, how important are prenuptial agreements? Well, unless you have the kind of prenuptial agreement that was so one-sided and ridiculous from the get-go, courts generally will uh, uphold a prenuptial agreement uh, as long as the parties complied with it. Uh, big issue with uh, prenuptial agreements might say, well, this property existed at the time of the marriage and therefore it's not considered marital property. But then if the one party goes and starts to commingle that property with the other marital assets, the protection is lost. But again, it, it's important from the standpoint of the property division. Again, it's not bulletproof because of the ability of, of spousal support to allow the invasion of that separate property. It's, uh, it's really important. And from the standpoint of spousal support, um, it's, it's not going to be determinative. Do you recommend uh, prenup in a second or third marriage? Typically, if there are children of the prior marriages, I think they're very important. I think uh, that even in a, uh, a recognition, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that the divorce rate is higher in second and third marriages than it is in a first marriage context. So I think they're very important uh, in order really to uh, uh, determine the ultimate beneficiaries of what the assets are. I don't think there may be an issue. Many prenuptial agreements provide very favorable provisions that in the event of the death of one spouse, that there's going to be a trust set up for the surviving spouse with the enjoyment of income and discretionary principle for the balance of their life. But that when they're both gone, that money gets effectively perhaps returned to the children of the uh, first marriage. And uh, that's very, that's very important. I mean, it used to be, uh, it's, in, it's been in the books for quite a few years, the whole notion of a Q-tip trust uh, was really uh, invented to recognize that the back in the 80s of the increased divorce rate and how can a person provide and get a favorable estate tax planning result while providing for a spouse, but making sure that that spouse does not move the funds away from the deceased spouse kids. So it's, it all factors into the plan. Again, hopefully it's a way to avoid litigation, especially if there's a, a death and uh, everyone's fighting over the marital estate. So, Well, it's also important, too, in, in a great divorce is that, again, this is the creativity. Typically, a court's going to say, this property belongs to one party, this property is going to the other party, that's it. In the context of negotiating the deal, it might be very well possible for the one party to set up, again, a trust for the benefit of the soon-to-be divorced spouse that provides all these wonderful uh, benefits and levels of support, but at the same time provides that upon perhaps that spouse's death, certainly upon her or his death, uh, or upon his or hers remarriage, then the trust terminates and the assets come flowing back. Again, these are devices and I hate to use that because that sometimes has a negative connotation. These are um, uh, approaches that can be done through negotiation. The courts don't have the ability to engage in this type of sophisticated uh, creativity. Jeff, you mentioned illness earlier, and especially as we're getting older, things happen. Uh, parts break down. Uh, we're, we're not immortal for lack of a better word. And as we get older, things are going to go wrong. But again, if you go to trial, I don't think the judges are really going to recognize a lot of these issues. But again, medical insurance can be a critical component of negotiations. And what about clauses with regard to spouse support? 
where you have a termination at the end of so many years, but of an illness that's catastrophic or something that's you know chronic and severe occurs during that time period, there can be a reopener. What are your thoughts on that? Well, a couple of comments. Uh, one, in, in terms of medical insurance, you know, often divorces want to provide that, sure, when one spouse gets to the age where they can qualify for Medicare, that's fine, but it's often good to build into a spousal support provision that the one spouse is going to provide for supplemental uh, Medicare insurance. You know, uh, the ability to get long-term care insurance may not necessarily be available. One thing that is certain, though, if you go to trial, the issue of future spousal support is always open. A court cannot make a final determination of what one party's obligation is to uh, on, on the subject of spousal support, and that's it, and it can never be dealt with in the future. In a settlement context, the parties can agree in specific terms as to what one party's obligation is to the other with regard to spousal, spousal support and can limit its, its ability to be modified or even prohibit its ability to be modified. Now, I mean, I can tell you that if I was representing an uh, individual who had some sig potential significant um, uh, physical or cognitive issues, I would never agree unless it was a really, really good deal to agree that the subject of spousal support would not be modifiable because it would be clear to my client's disinterest. But again, if you work out an agreement, you can bring finality to it. Uh, if you go to court, it's always subject to being reopened. And if a spouse may be in perfect health at the time of the divorce, but a few years later, there's an onset of some cognitive ability, that could be revisited. Let's go to cognitive issues. And I've seen more and more cases uh, especially with as we're aging with people, sometimes with early onset of Alzheimer's and dementia, sometimes hitting in their 50s and 60s. I've known of some prominent attorneys over the years who've been hit by it and literally had to give up their careers in their early to mid 60s. And so it's there. It's more and more uh, predominant. What if you are concerned that your client or the other client maybe having cognitive issues as a divorce is about to ensue? What steps should you take? Well, well first and foremost, from the standpoint of my client, and, and just be aware I didn't mention this, I've served six years on the Attorney Grievance Commission as a commissioner, so I'm very well aware of the obligations that are imposed upon attorneys. Their number one obligation is that they need to make sure that their client is freely and knowingly and well in, on a well-informed basis understands the consequences of the proceedings, proposed settlements, and ultimately a settlement. And as an attorney and uh, one of my colleagues who I think has done an uh, interview with you, uh, Henry Sandy Glazier, has even written articles upon representing individuals who may be under some type of uh, cognitive impairment. You have an obligation to make the appropriate inquiries to ascertain that they've got the ability to knowingly understand what they're uh, maybe signing on to. And to the extent that uh, as an attorney, you come to uh, your good faith conclusion that your client lacks that ability, uh, I believe there's an obligation that there's a number of things you can do, and not the least of which is perhaps you know advise the court because there is a court rule, which is the next point is is that the judge believes, and has uh, reason to believe that from what they, he or she has observed that this client may be lacking in certain cognition, they can't move forward. Now, the probate court, which appoints guardians and conservators for individuals who are under some type of legal incapacity, can certainly have the ability to represent the person with this cognitive uh, challenge in a divorce context. But the whole point is, is that that individual has to be protected from being taken so, advantage of. So Jeff, in that situation, it probably would be who, an attorney who's really being, for due diligence purposes, to have an independent guardian and or conservator appointed. 
Absolutely. And again, another area I practice in is professional liability defense, which means, and you know, you've seen instances where an attorney is accused of dropping the ball for his or her uh, client. And I've seen it in divorce context. And the point is, is that the attorney has to exercise independent professional judgment in representing the client, even if that judgment would require that attorney to say things uh, to uh, the client that the client really doesn't want to hear. But the point is, is they have that obligation to uh, exercise independent professional judgment. And if that judgment is that there needs to be a protective proceeding filed within the probate court, yes, that's something that has to be done. What are other thoughts that you can raise uh, that you think are important that separate a great divorce from a typical divorce? Well, you know, there's a, a saying uh, that if you have kids, you're not really ever divorced. No, that's true. <laughs> and particularly if you have grandchildren, then you really are uh, never divorced. And, 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 and happily, I've been in a situation where um, while divorces can be contentious, I haven't seen the kind of, I've been blessed to not have to contend with divorces where there's been issues of uh, significant, uh, well, first of any domestic violence, in my opinion, is significant. But where there's a, a significant level of, uh, uh, of uh, substance abuse, I mean, beyond mere social drinking, you might have an addiction, severe addiction issue, substance, uh, other substance abuse, uh, domestic violence. Yes, those kinds of cases make it exceedingly difficult Sure. the parties to be able to work together. But happily, in most cases, whether it's a younger divorce where both parties are committed to try to end things with some level of dignity and grace, it's all the more necessary in uh, a gray divorce that either it's a long-term marriage from the get-go or it's a second marriage, at, but each party has a choice. Can we end this with some dignity and grace and try to fashion a result that allows both parties to move forward where they're not going to be financially hamstrung and in a fashion which preserves the ability to be able to show up at celebrations for grandchildren or even children uh, uh, without uh, having to have one person shows and the other person has to leave. That's, that's such an important point you're raising. We're running short on time. Before we finalize our interview in session, which has been very, very helpful. Can you give us some takeaways for our viewers that, you know, kind of summarize what we've been yeah. discussing? Well, all divorces impose financial hardships. It's unavoidable. There may be some rare exceptions, but in general, they, they impose financial hardships. The parties are going to have a much more difficult time to recover from those hardships if it's occurring in their 50s, 60s, or, or later. So that's one point. Two, for the spouse who has not been involved regularly in the job market, it's going to be much harder to get back in there. Even though we have laws against age discrimination, the fact of the matter is, is if the, if the employers can hire somebody over 40 and not be accused of age discrimination. So it's much tougher. Spousal support is clearly, uh, in my view, a one of the major issues in the gray divorce. Uh, pensions and Social Security are important issues, of course, but the offer also offered because of the fact that they're going to be available. These are resources that aren't, you know, when you're young, you can't invade your pensions without significant income tax penalties and other problems. So they become a, an important resource to be able to use in fashioning the best possible result. And, and finally, yes, the party's health and cognitive issues, which typically don't man aren't manifested themselves in the 30s and 40s, can become a significant problem and directly impact uh, the ability of the parties to fashion a result that they want, that, but they have to be considered. Jeff, we're out of time. I wanna thank you so much for being our guest on Gracefully Graying. I mean, you've covered an important topic very thoroughly and very well. And I want to thank our viewers for watching Gracefully Graying. Again, as a reminder, please watch this video and on our Gracefully Graying YouTube channel and like and visit our Gracefully Graying site. Jeff, it has been a pleasure having you as our guest. Pleasure. I hope I can come back on a different subject at some point. Definitely. All right. Thank you, Henry.